Hello, my name is Dr. Jessia Berry. I'm an epidemiologist at the University of Adelaide. This video accompanies our article, which has been published in the September 2020 issue of Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology. Our article is entitled, The Definition and Diagnosis of Cerebral Palsy in Genetic Studies, A Systematic Review. This began as an honours project for Ryan Pham in the School of Public Health. We wrote this article together with Ben Moll, Lyle Palmer and co-authors from the Australian Collaborative Cerebral Palsy Research Group led by Alastair McLennan and Joseph Getz. Gene discovery research is relatively new in cerebral palsy. In recent decades, numerous studies have emerged proposing a link between many different genetic variants and cerebral palsy. There is a question as to how these studies define and diagnose cerebral palsy. We noticed the study approaches differed, so we decided to critique them using a systematic review methodology to inform guidelines for the reporting of such studies. A lack of consistency in case ascertainment makes it hard to interpret the findings of studies in relation to one another. My name is Ryan Pham and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Adelaide. We searched the scientific literature from when genomic studies began in the 1990s up to the end of 2019. We included genetic studies where the main outcome was cerebral palsy and the study was a case control study or case only design with population controls. These studies used laboratory techniques such as microarrays and next generation sequencing to compare the frequency of alleles or genotypes at genetic marker loci in unrelated individuals to look for genetic variants that play a role in the causation of cerebral palsy. We identified 57 genetic studies conducted during this 30 year period. We critically appraised how these studies defined and assessed cerebral palsy. Our measures were whether a study complied with an international consensus definition of cerebral palsy, the ages at which the children were recruited and diagnosed, and whether a clinical assessment was done by a suitably qualified person, such as a paediatric neurologist. More information can be found in our paper. I'm Dr. Susanna McLennan, paediatric neurologist at the Women's and Children's Hospital in Adelaide. The term cerebral palsy describes a group of permanent, non-progressive disorders of movement and posture, and the clinical features in young children can be quite variable. Diagnosis is usually made over a period of time, based on sequential clinical observations and assessments of movement and posture associated with activity limitation. Currently, half of cases are diagnosed in the first year of life and three quarters by two years of age. However, particularly to exclude progressive disorders and for milder cases, diagnosis at the age of two years or older is more reliable. Best practice is for children to be followed to rule out transient motor problems and very importantly, progressive disorders such as hereditary spastic paraplegia. This is the reason that for genetic studies of cerebral palsy, the most suitable international consensus guideline is by the group Surveillance of Cerebral Palsy in Europe. This guideline recommends children should be at least four years of age before being included in official case counts. Among the 57 genetic studies we assessed, only 18 or 32% defined cerebral palsy in compliance with the international consensus guideline developed by the surveillance of cerebral palsy in Europe. And unfortunately, it was not possible to determine how many of the remaining studies used a diagnostic cutoff of at least two years of age, because many of these studies did not give the age of diagnosis. The only information we had was the age of recruitment. From this, we could see that many studies included young infants and toddlers, and none stated that children were followed up so we concluded that the majority of the studies were lax in their phenotypic definition of cerebral palsy. We also ranked the studies on the quality of the information they provided about how they ascertained cases of cerebral palsy, including whether a consensus definition was used, who diagnosed the patient and how it was done, and what the inclusion and exclusion criteria were. We found 17 or 30% of the studies to be well described. 33 gave incomplete information and seven were poorly described. 
we found no consistent application of exclusion criteria between the studies. The reason a particular exclusion was applied was usually not explained or justified. For example, genetic studies would often exclude ataxia, genetic syndromes, chromosomal abnormalities or congenital anomalies. However, there is no obvious reason to do so. According to the International Consensus Guidelines, children with these criteria, in addition to their movement disorder, would still be classified as cerebral palsy. This failure to use uniform guidelines and mediocre reporting of case ascertainment limits our confidence in these genetic studies and their findings. There needs to be a standard level of reporting to a consensus definition where an examination by a suitably qualified clinician has occurred and the age of diagnosis is stated. Genetic studies should include children diagnosed with cerebral palsy at no younger than two years of age, but preferably at four years and above. Careful thought should be given to avoid unnecessary exclusion criteria so that studies can be better compared to one another. In conclusion, we found only a third of studies defined and ascertained cerebral palsy correctly in children using international consensus guidelines. This has important implications for gene discovery research, given the potential for misclassification of unrelated neurological conditions as cerebral palsy. We hope you are inspired to read the article in full in the September 2020 issue. Thank you for listening.